Hello there, this is Michael Wu from United Wolves Productions, and welcome to another episode of Behind the Lens. In this episode, we'll be looking closely at Roommates Episode 3, Dude. As always, your support means the world to us, so consider subscribing, liking, sharing, and hitting that notification bell so you can stay up to date with everything we've got planned here for you. As always, we will begin with the writing, so I'm giving the word back to the disembodied voice of our writer. Take it away, Dylan. How do you keep finding me? Episode 3 is quite simple. It revolves around Angelina's reaction to finding out where Jeremy is from and what his relationship to Harry is. The main challenge arrived in molding this conversation, covering these three topics in such a way where it remains entertaining for three minutes. Michael? What is consistent with the three episodes so far is that there has been character development present, though not much in the way of character progression. Character development is how effectively one is built, so the audience is able to understand and know them. Character progression is how one changes along the narrative. During the initial two episodes, Jeremy has been the one getting most of the character work done. However, in episode 3, a majority of it focuses on Angelina and Harry, Harry in particular, due to the sparse amount of time he has been on screen, with much of that time in isolation. Considering the topic of conversation and the logistics of how Jeremy arrived in the first place, the emphasis should be the reaction Angelina has to the information presented, showing concern for Harry, while Harry himself is indifferent, not only to Jeremy and Angelina, but towards himself too. In terms of the script, the first iteration was five pages, and was a vomit draft, a vomit draft is when a writer throws ideas onto a page and refines it afterwards as opposed to planning beforehand. Each writer will gravitate towards their preference. This show is an example of where there were episodes that were vomit drafts and others that had extensive notes before being written, though that is for another time. There were three distinct drafts of the script before filming commenced, draft one being five pages long, the second two and a half, and finally three pages. While the main body of the script maintains much of the same material, the ending has changed consistently. In draft 1, rather than the argument fizzling out as it does in the episode, Angelina and Jeremy continue to bicker as if leading to a larger argument, which would be typical of them. However, in draft 2, rather than Angelina being frustrated with Jeremy alone, she is annoyed at Harry too. Jeremy for being so flippant with the topic at hand, and Harry being so casual with his own soul. In the final written version of the script, Angelina is disheartened by everything that she just learned, only for Jeremy to end the episode with a joke. While the lines are the same, the delivery of them is what is interesting. You'll notice in the script, there was a heavy dose of sarcasm present in the way Jeremy is speaking to Angelina. However, when Michael delivers the line, it is far more muted and almost matter-of-fact, which is far more consistent with the character. Couple this with Zori's subdued reaction to learning all of this makes the tone of the ending far more appropriate. With all that out of the way, I'm going to try my best to escape. Thank you, Dylan. As always, if you care to support Dylan's work and his personal video essays and analysis, take a look at his channel Bob Lob V2 up there in the corner. On our side of writing, we knew that this particular episode will further the lore more than anything else and the characters within it. As you probably have seen in the episode, we have the revelation that Jeremy actually comes from hell and is in fact a type of a demon. Because of that, we knew that the style would be a little more relaxed, not too, di too many different shots, not too many cuts, but we'll keep it relaxed and we'll let the story drive the, the entire scene forward. You'd also notice that this is the first episode that we shot in the living room, so we had a little bit more experimentation to do with the lighting, and um, it, we didn't have as much depth when it comes to uh, certain shots. But, uh, of course, the location sometimes dictates the restraints that you have over creativity. Now, in terms of um, objectives for the characters, this time, 
actually we don't have that many opposing objectives. In the very beginning, there was um, a slight opposition between Jeremy trying to convince Angelina that he is in fact from hell and her being in disbelief, but once she accepts it, it becomes less of a battle between the two of them and uh, more of a inquiry on her behalf as to why Jeremy is there and what exactly happened. When Harry comes in, then her objectives shift to a small confrontation with Harry as to whether that was the most clever move he could have made by summoning Jeremy over for a help with an essay. In a similar fashion, this way we wanted to make sure that the feel of the scene itself slightly separates. Because Jeremy and Angelina don't have an opposing viewpoint this way, we kept them on one side of the room and as still keeping it slightly flatter. And when Harry comes in, we open the room in a, in a more three-dimensional fashion. This way, having Jeremy on one side, Harry on the other side, and Angelina bang on in the middle, both in the flat surface that we already know as the living room and in the depth of the kitchen. Oh, another thing to mention, of course, is uh, so far this is the shortest episode because it actually achieves what it sets out to do quicker than the other of the episodes. We just wanted to introduce the idea of hell, of um, who Jeremy is, where does he come from, why is he there, and what's his function within the roommate scenario. And uh, as that happens quite quickly, so is the episode a little on the short side. And now, as always, let's focus on the framing and lighting side of things. We'll begin the episode with another of another moving shot, or as I call it, fancy shot, firstly revealing the books that Angelina and Jeremy read. Now we were wondering, of course, what those characters might be reading. It was a unanimous decision that she'll be reading something superficial and he'll be reading something a little more macabre, manipulative, if you will. So of course for her we picked Date Rich Mary Well, because that would mean that she has to do not a lot to get whatever she wants out of life. And Jeremy would be reading how to manipulate everyone. And I, I really think that the pitchfork completes the look and um, foreshadows a little bit what's to come in the episode. Oh, having said that, Jeremy is probably the least manipulative out of the three roommates, but we'll talk about that another time. Then the camera pulls away to reveal that both of them are kind of reading in unison, even scratching their legs in unison, showing that although they bicker in their own characters, although from two very separate sides of the spectrum, they are, they're like a two sides of the same coin, if you will. This particular frame is only lit by the big Godox softbox that sits slightly off to the side, not very much in the center, but off to the side uh, of Jeremy and it lights everything. That's why it's a little bit flat, but because we also get the natural light from the window there, it doesn't really feel too superficial, it doesn't feel too unnatural. We keep it on the two shot until the beginning of the conversation happens, and when Jeremy mentioned that he's from hell, we cut to an over-the-shoulder one. In a Now, normally we've used this in a more confrontational manner up until now in previous episodes. But you notice that this time in the OTSs, the face of, or rather the back of the face or the back of the head of the person who's closer to the camera is not overtaking too much of the frame of the other person. This is just to say that they're on slightly opposing sides because of course he's going, she's not going to believe him yet, but um, they're not on a confrontational side enough to fill each other's frame. A slightly annoying thing to mention here, we really wanted um, both in the OTSs and the two shot to have a backlight, but unfortunately, because of the layout of the room, <clears throat> you notice that um, on the side of the door, it, it has a small sharp turn as if the whole couch is between two smaller walls, for a lack of a better term. So we couldn't even get a proper C stand up there because there was no space whatsoever. So I'd say that that's something that's um, slightly bothering me and a little lacking, but there was nothing that we could do. Although, as I mentioned, it is quite flat. You notice it, it's something very small that you wouldn't normally take notice of it, but I, I thought it, 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 um, it elevates it slightly. The two pillows that are on top of the uh, uh, on top of the sofa, 
they're put there for color so that it doesn't, um, you, you, you don't just view our head on a completely white surface, but there is a little bit of color um, and thus not as flat as it could have been. So still a slight improvement in the um, set design department, shall we say. Next on, after Jeremy says, well, there you go, this prompts Angelina to start believing in what Jeremy was saying. So we move on to the two shot, showing both Angelina slightly frightened now and uh, Jeremy not getting what was the big deal. But once the conversation carries on, we actually cut to an internal medium close-up rather than an OTS, because now we are getting to the core of the um, conversation at hand, we move to a more intimate position of the camera, being within the conversation rather than outside of an argument. After you can try, we then cut back to the um, far two shot, because now we're changing the subject yet again. And this time it becomes a conversation of why and how he comes to be there. Of course, the introduction of um, Harry into the equation now moves the conversation back on an OTS because in the beginning she is too um, dumbfounded to think of who exactly could have summoned him and he gets agitated with her for the next part of the scene until she realizes that it is Harry in fact. Oh, another thing to mention here, actually we shot two different um, ways of, of this joke. And I do think that we've picked the right one. Um, originally, it was either three people live here, you didn't so many, so that leaves. And then the reaction slowly getting more and more agitated. There was another version where we had Jeremy, well, me, um, leave on the S for as long as until she realizes. So it was something like uh, three people live here, you didn't summon me, so that leaves. But uh, in the editing process, we decided to use, um, well, we decided to use the one without the elongated S, and I think we made the right call. We move slightly more, again, on an internal MCU to uh, show her acceptance of the whole of the reality, not only who is there, but where does he come from, and who summoned him. And then once they figure out why he's there, you notice that when they cut to Jeremy, when we cut to Jeremy to say, it is, the framing is slightly different. Now this time it was because this is the beginning of the next moving shot. But before that we cut back to an internal MCU. And we come to the, um, the moving shot where Harry comes in. The camera follows Harry, then goes back to Angelina. When we cut to Harry to say milk, now this is the first time we actually open the, it's the first time we open the framing with the depth of the kitchen. Now on the shot of Harry, he is still a little bit lit by the Godox in the living room, but also he, because of the bigger space, um, has a backlight which is sitting comfortably next to the fridge. The previous moving shot that followed Harry carries on with Angelina, which is why the shot of Harry saying milk was handheld, well, not on a handheld, but on a stabilizer, because the two shots needed to match. We couldn't have the static shot of Harry and the moving shot of Angelina. But the original moving shot carries on with Angelina as she stands up and goes towards Harry. His shots keep being handheld until she asks why. And then we move to an over the shoulder towards Harry, because now they're in a little confrontation that the mood of her attitude towards him is slightly confrontational. You also notice that in these OTSs, whoever's closest to the camera actually takes quite a bit of the frame because it is a bigger confrontational element than the over the shoulder ones in the beginning of the scene. The entire next of the scene is comprised of over the shoulder shots from various angles towards various characters. We actually shot quite a bit of those here. We have an over the shoulder from Jeremy's head towards Angelina and Harry, stacking all the characters. We have an over the shoulder shot from Angelina towards Jeremy. We have an over the shoulder from Harry to Angelina and Jeremy. 
and an over the shoulder from Angelina towards Harry. The biggest reactory factor here is Angelina, so in a lot of the cuts and shots and frames, the camera is closest to her as she experiences the conversation with both male parties, and then the camera only moves when a bigger reaction from her is needed. We then cut to the final handheld moving shot, where Harry goes away to the toilet, Jeremy goes up the stairs, and the camera does a slow parallax towards Angelina as she reacts to the new information and the episode ends. Of course, in that final shot, the backlight has been moved. Now it's um, slightly close to the window, but she's still primarily lit by the Godox in the living room. And then we fade to black. In terms of problem solving, there wasn't much of that here other than the uh, problematic backlights. And the other thing was during the actual shooting process, the OTS is at the very end, matching essentially four different over the shoulder ones, making sure that they have the same type of framing, but also the possibility to cut from any one to any of the other ones at any point during the editing process. That was quite, um, quite a challenge, which neatly does bring me to the editing process. There wasn't a big difficulty until Harry comes in because everything was a shot reverse shot, be that on an over the shoulder or an internal MCU. But once Harry comes in, then there was a lot of choices to be made on where exactly do we cut from which shot to which shot? So this is how we made the decision in this particular instance. So when Angelina stands up and assumes her position to the first over the shoulder shot, essentially Harry's explanation of why he summoned Jeremy, we wanted to keep on him for that whole explanation. And when we say, and here I am, now th this was a debate, it was either cut to an over-the-shoulder towards Harry, to an over-the-shoulder towards Jeremy, because um, we wanted both of them to explain the entire situation. So it was either that or cut towards Angelina from over-the-shoulder of Harry to show her turning to him. But that overcomplicated complicated um, the situation and it, it didn't feel... it felt disjointed. So we cut to an over-the-shoulder the towards Jeremy, and then we cut to an over-the-shoulder towards both Angelina and Harry in the background. Essentially, she becomes the middle between the two fighting sides, because she wants to hear the whole story from Harry, she keeps turning to him, but then having to turn back to Jeremy for his side of the explanation, until finally Harry takes the word, which is the only other time we cut to an over-the-shoulder towards Harry rather than the over-the-shoulder two-shot towards Angelina and Harry. Now, this was very complicated. I, I do hope you could follow along with this. If there's any questions, please leave them down below and I'll be um, sure to address them in a later episode. And, of course, as always, we'll finish this episode with a review of the final product, see if I would do anything differently, any glaring problems that um, become obvious to me, and uh, all that jazz. I think the books do a great service to both characters. You know what? I never asked you, where are you actually from? Hell. <laughs> Funny, but seriously, where? I told you. Hell. <sighs> what? What do you mean, what? Well, you asked. Still. Would you have preferred the lie? Well, no. Well, there you go. Why is this so hard for you? Because you told me you're from hell. So what, you're a demon? I am a dude. The realization of Angelina that he actually is from hell is a little bit in the quiet, perhaps. We should have either cut to a closer shot of her as she realizes that she is slightly frightened of that idea and maybe did 
a little, uh, well, give it a little bit more of a big deal to it. It's not that it doesn't work, but I think it could work better. I'm going to kill you. You can try. Fine. Why are you here? I was summoned. By? Who do you think? I don't know. Three people live in this house. You didn't summon me. So that leaves? Jeremy's realization that Angelina can't put two and two together here to realize it's actually Harry is, is pretty hilarious. I'm very happy with how it turned out and that we didn't use the other option. Harry? Yes! Why would he do that? <sighs> he had trouble with his literature assignment. Literature? Yep. All right, but that's done now. It is. And you're still here because... I'm waiting for him to die so I can drag him back to hell. Harry coming in here is slightly overexposed on the right side of his face, but uh, we couldn't do much more to that because this was actually the, the natural light coming from outside. You! I got the coffee. Not that! Milk? You sold your soul? All that! Yeah. But why? Well, we were doing Dr. Faustus, so I thought, why not ask an actual dude? And here I am. Stop calling yourself a dude. But that's what I am. I get it. You're a dude. But calling yourself one is so obnoxious. That's my profession. Being a dude? Yes. A demon assuring desires exclusively. Your turn to cook. And the three people ending up doing their own thing at the end of the episode actually quite makes it quite um, um, quite a more flexible ending. I quite quite like this one. Yeah, there actually isn't much that I would change. You know, other than perhaps the backlight during the two shot of the OTSs in the beginning, but I already said there wasn't much more we could have done there. Overall, I'm quite happy with how this turned out to be. And that concludes this episode of Behind the Lens, where we looked at Roommates Episode 3, Dude. Join us next time, where we're going to be looking at uh, Roommates Episode 4, Finding X. In the meantime, We'd appreciate if you subscribe to our channel so you keep in the loop with everything we've got going on at United Wolves Productions. And, you know, consider liking, sharing, subscribing, hitting that notification bell so we can keep on entertaining you and hopefully educating you in your next step of your filmmaking career. Maybe even consider subscribing to our Patreon account. We have kept it slightly emptier until now, but we are starting to fill it up with more and more useful information and some um, exclusive content. I've been Michael Wolf at United Wolves Productions, and join us next time for another episode of Behind the Lens. <laughs>